Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. My name is Chris Badgett and I'm joined today with Robbie McLeod from Beaver Builder. And Beaver Builder is a page building software for WordPress. We actually use it at Lifter LMS. If you go to demo.lifterlms.com, you can see how we've used Beaver Builder to spice up our, uh, our demo site that has a bunch of sample courses and that sort of thing on there. We are going to talk a little bit about the Beaver Builder page building software today, but one of the great things about Robbie and what he's been up to at Beaver Builder is just his experience as an online entrepreneur, as somebody who's been at the digital game for a while, building products, serving a community, of, you know, growing and evolving over time. So we can get into some, you know, just general issues that are relevant to you as an entrepreneur, as a teacher, as an online course creator, and and really, uh, Robbie and I can really wrap on some uh, just experiences in, in figuring this whole thing out uh, in the digital world. So, Robbie, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, to get into a little bit about Beaver Builder, it's a page building plugin for WordPress. And if anybody wants to find out about the history of Beaver Builder and the story and what it does, I'd encourage you to just Google uh, some other podcasts where, where Robbie and, and Justin and Billy, they talk about their, their journey. But in this episode, we're going to kind of go into a little different angle, just more about online business in general. But I do want to touch on the fact that it's not just you. There's three people kind of, uh, there's more than three behind the business, but you guys are kind of the main force behind Beaver Builder. How did that come to be in terms of being a three person sh company as opposed to a one person company? Yeah, we, so I found um, my two partners are Justin and Billy and I found them through a Craigslist ad years back, um, which is funny. It's not the first time I've, you know, heard people say something similar with, with Craigslist. It's such a good way to bring people together. Um, yeah, before, before I was doing um, web work, I was working at a YMCA and I kind of, you know, it was a, it was a fun job, but it was kind of dead end. Like, and it wasn't, like a career and I was getting a little older and decided I needed to get you know, like a real job quote unquote. Um, and so I started looking on, on Craigslist. I'd always had a passion for, for web and, and design and, and coding. And I was reluctant to get into that as a career. Cause the kind of idea of like sitting at a computer all day, like I would have rather been, you know, outside or doing something like being a rock star or professional video gamer, you know, like, but <laughs> I reached that age where I was like, okay, I really need to like, I have this, you know, skill set and I should leverage it. Um, but yeah, long story short, I found them on Craigslist and we started working together. They hired me on as part of um, our web agency, which we no longer have. Um, and we started working on Beaver Builder as a side project. And the guys and I, we all got along really, really well. And they were, you know, really, I'm really fortunate that they offered, you know, they wanted to bring me on as more than an employee. Um, so originally when we started Beaver Builder, we started it just as a side, it was going to be a side company. And we all three were going to be equal partners in that as opposed to where I was uh, an employee with the, the, the agency business. And it eventually just kind of engulfed Beaver Builder, engulfed the agency um, and, it, from like the logistics standpoint too, it, it made a little bit more sense just to kind of take that, that partner structure and, and run with it. So yeah, I, I got, uh, I got, I lucked out, <laughs> found them, found them on Craigslist and you know, we became fast friends too. And we hang out a lot outside of the, the work zone. So yeah, that's kind of how that started out. That's awesome. And I, I've got a background as a solopreneur, but over time I've ended up in partnerships and, you know, at Lifter LMS, it's not just me. There's, I have a partner and we, we have a team of about 10 people right now, but the, uh, the partnership has been critical to the success and so just not trying to do it all alone. Sometimes the solopreneur thing can be kind of sexy or, you know, you maybe you want to try to maintain control over equity and things like that. But in my experience, uh, having some quality partners is well worth the, you know, sharing the ownership and that sort of thing. And, and really just not having to do it all because especially in the online world, it can be somewhat overwhelming to do the marketing, the engineering, and the managing the team and managing the business. There's like so many things to do that for one person to do all of it over time, especially as you grow bigger, it's really hard to 
and stressful to maintain that all the responsibilities of that leadership. So how do you guys divide up who does what? And I'll just preface that by saying, you know, we give ourselves at Lifter LMS, you know, CEO, CTO, kind of these titles, but it doesn't really matter. There's, there's like individual tasks or response areas of responsibilities that we chop up, which may or may not fit into those labels. But how do you guys do it? Like, how do you divide it up? Who does what? Yeah, we had a, a similar story when we, uh, we incorporated, you know, we all kind of had to come up with the labels for the lawyers, right? Like the CTO and the um, CEO and all that. But, but we don't pay attention to those at all. We, we consider ourselves all kind of like equal partners and, and, you know, there's three captains on the ship. It's not really, you know, any one of us that's leading more than the other. Um, when we were, so when we were working as a web agency, we used to say that we were kind of like three freelancers that just worked under the same umbrella of a company. Mm-hmm. So, as opposed to like having our own areas of expertise within the agency work, we were all kind of doing the client onboarding and then building websites and then doing the ongoing maintenance. Um, we all kind of had our, our areas that we excelled at at that time, but we still, you know, Billy, Justin and I were all working on websites and building websites. So we all had that kind of shared skill set. Um, and then when we transferred to Beaver Builder, we had the opportunity to kind of specialize a little bit more. Um, so Justin is our lead developer. He's the, you know, he's the code wrangler, um, does the lion's share of the building. Um, Billy is our kind of like business and operations guy. So he also manages our support and our affiliate programs, um, handles like our accounting and our finance. Uh, he does, he had a, he has a background in HR. So he also does a lot of our kind of hiring and, and managing of employees. And then um, I was kind of the odd man out, right? Because uh, we needed someone to do like marketing and none of us really had any business or uh, not business, but any um, experience in marketing or even like a whole lot of desire. Like I used to think marketing was like, like sales and advertising. Like you think of like the greasy salesman, like car salesman guy and you're like, Oh, I don't <laughs> that guy. But um yeah, so but we needed, we recognized like we needed someone to jump into that role. And so that was kind of the role I, I jumped into. And it's been a really fun journey for me. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of organic how we all fell into those niches. Like, so Justin just started building this thing in his, in his side time. And um, yeah, we all started, you know, like jumping in to support him in that process and kind of finding like where we could help. And then those roles just kind of materialized over time through that process. That's awesome. Well, if you're listening to this, I mean, there's some, there's strength in numbers and then maybe you're hitting a roadblock because there's a skill set that you don't have, or you're just not set up for. So perhaps consider partnerships for your project because um, you know, you can definitely stay alone too long and burn out and, and end up in some bad places or just not reach your potential because you lacked a, the right partnership. So Totally. I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I've always had kind of hobbies and passions that I get really obsessive over and I'll, I'll get into something and I'll learn it really, really deeply and I'll get to like, you know, pretty far along, whether that's like, you know, playing guitar was one of the things I was hoping to do when I was younger and, and got pretty far along in that. But then, yeah, the burnout my whole life has been, it's just, you get to that point where you lose interest in those things and um, having partners for me, especially is a motivator to keep going and kind of get over those humps, you know, or the speed blocks that you run into when you're trying to progress through whatever it is, be it, you know, professional or a hobby. Um, You know, your, your partners are there to kind of pick you up when you're, when you're down and vice versa. And, And yeah, if you can luck out and find someone that you're compatible with that also is complementary to your skill set you're just, you're just golden. And then again, I mentioned, I feel so fortunate that I met those guys because we really have that. Uh, we get along really, really well. And then we also have these very complementary skill sets where there's not a whole lot of overlap in what we're doing anymore. Which is super, super powerful. Like just to give yeah. the, you guys an example. Um, I don't know if my partner Thomas has ever listened to one of these podcast episodes and this is over a hundred. I've never actually read a line of his code. (laughs) So, I mean, I've seen it maybe here or there, but like we're focusing on very different parts of the business and that's just kind of an extreme example. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Well, well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about marketing because 
you know, a lot of people listen to the show, they're teachers, they're experts, they're entrepreneurs, uh, or, you know, may, but maybe they don't have an, a, a more advanced marketing skill set. And I'm a lot like you, I think, in that I used to think that sales was uh, evil or I, was, I, didn't, I wasn't really that interested in it. But over time, it really grew on me. I mean, now I'm on the opposite side where it's a great thing and I really enjoy it. And it's about service and education and all that sort of thing. But uh, when somebody's, when I'm looking at my marketing strategy or, you know, looking at somebody else's business and examining their marketing, I divide it into three areas, inbound, outbound, and relationships. Inbound meaning content marketing, stuff you create that like attracts people like this podcast episode. Outbound would be like, prospecting or cold emailing, cold calling, reaching out to somebody who's or a company that's never heard of you. And then relationships is really what it sounds like, you know, relating to people, maybe they're further along on the journey, maybe they're influencers in your industry, maybe they're at a similar place than you, maybe they're, you're helping somebody out who's um, trying to get to where you are. It's not, it's, it can go in all kinds of directions. There's all kinds of relationship building, but how do you approach those three areas of inbound, outbound, and relationships? We, um, I like, yeah, I like that. I like that system of breaking it down. Um, for inbound, I think one of our, I mean, this might seem like a cliche answer, but one of our strongest kind of inbound tools is our product itself. Yeah. Um, we've, you know, again, like we didn't have a background or experience in marketing. So a lot of, and even still to this day, um, word of mouth marketing has been a huge for us. And we have a really passionate community of users that really love our product. And um, so that I think, yeah, that's, that's been, that's been like our main inbound has just been generating a quality product. I mean, that, that can apply to anything if you're doing courses or businesses, you know, like if it's something you're passionate about and you're building something that you have, um, you know, the, the quality will speak for itself, I guess. Um, and it's, it's really, it's really, really difficult to, I mean, when, if you don't have, if you're not selling something of quality that you believe in, then you get into that kind of skeevy side of marketing where you're kind of just pushing this, you know, when you're trying to sell something or when you're trying to, you know, make something out to be um, really, really great when it's not like that's when it feels kind of yucky. But if you have something quality of value and then it just becomes, you know, communicating that like helping people in a way, right? Like if you're looking for this and you need to do it well, we have this and how do you make that happen? As far as the out, I think for I think for us outbound and relationships kind of go together in a way too. Um, like when we first got started, so that's the thing, right? The, the inbound, it's like the chicken and the egg problem, too, <laughs> right? right? It's like yeah. you can have this like great content, but if nobody knows you're there, like you kind of got to reach out and get people. Um, and we did everything that you like, you know, we, we put together the list and the spreadsheet of like the you know 50 or 75 wordpress blogs and <laughs> send in contact forms and all of them and yeah. search for all of the best like top 10 page builder articles and and left comments on all of them and you know back when we were when we were getting started we were hustling a lot harder i guess to kind of get our name out there um i like to use that like snowball analogy you know like we started with a really small snowball and had to put a lot of work into into building it and then as you kind of keep rolling it and keep building it it grows and grows and eventually it kind of gains its own momentum and starts taking off and you can step back a little bit um and but then yeah relationships uh too uh, we were like before we started recording we were talking about conferences and um we so chris and i just for a little background right we met in cabo at cabo press which is an event hosted by chris lemma and i think we both kind of had the experience i remember talking to you about it where it was a really hard trip to justify because you know the, like the travel and the ticket like it was a little bit of an investment and not having done anything like it before we were kind of curious if like, you know, is this just going to be like a really expensive beach vacation and uh, <laughs> that we can write off our taxes, but it definitely, it, it that, that, that event in particular. Um, and then all the follow-up events where I was kind of meeting all of those people in that network that we built there really ingrained this idea that like meeting people in person and building those relationships in person, there's just nothing like it. Like you can get to know people virtually and, and, you know, we're tweet tweeting at people and talking with people in Slack, right. but, but nothing beats that face to face um, interaction and, and getting to know someone kind of on a more personal level. So 
that's something that we've just recently identified as being really valuable. And I think we're going to try and do a lot more of, or at least keep that, keep that train, train a rolling. Cause it's fun too, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it is fun. And, um, it's always good to get out of the building and, uh, you know, go rub shoulders with people. That's what it's all about. Yeah. <clears throat> well, just building on that relationships thing. Um, uh, there's some quote, I, I can't remember the exact who said it or whatever, but a lot of times with goals, some people say that it's common for people to aim too low. Uh, and one of the areas there that has really impressed me with what you guys have done with Beaver Builder is that you've worked out a distribution deal with um, a hosting company with, with GoDaddy. Yeah. Um, so what that is, like if you're an online course creator and you're looking at your platform, perhaps you might be able to get your course out there in a much bigger way with a much bigger company or brand that already has a distribution network. For example, um, this podcast is on YouTube, it's on iTunes. I'm using uh, those services to help distribute uh, the content. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, Lifter LMS, for example, has a free version of the plugin. You know, you get started for free. That's we're using the WordPress repository to distribute uh, the plugin. But that can be done with courses and content and in all kinds of interesting ways. But can you tell us a little bit about any lessons learned or how you guys, how it even came on your radar to seek that distribution channel, which my understanding is it's autom your Beaver Builder is automatically installed on um, some GoDaddy hosting account. So how did all that play out and what would you recommend to somebody who's thinking about a bigger distribution? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good segue. Um, again, we, we lucked out, right? Like this, it was, it was really fortunate how all of these kind of pieces came together. Um, but circling back to the idea of relationships, uh, when we were first starting Beaver Builder within the first maybe six months or so, um, we were all, uh, well, we used to all share an office. We're all distributed now. Um, but our office was in Campbell, California, which is just down the road from uh, Sunnyvale, where GoDaddy's, one of their satellite offices is. And they were doing, um, they were looking into page builders. They were, I mean, this was a couple of years back now, two or so years back. And they were, you, you can kind of see where they've gone with this, this, you know, we've been able to see this idea progress, but they were looking at page builders and they were basically just looking at ways to um, onboard people and make it easier for people to build websites on their hosting. And they did a, a search of all the page builders out there. Um, they, they liked us and we happened to be local. So they reached out to us and we did an in-person meeting and we got to know them face to face, um, which was, you know, invaluable. Um, I think it definitely gave us a leg up just that we happened to be in the, the same vicinity and we got to, you know, meet them and get to know them on a personal level. And then, so fast forward, um, a couple months or years even later, we never really ended up getting something going from those initial conversations. Like we had just gotten our feet wet. Um, and luck, I think this is like, with hindsight, it was a good thing too, because the, the kind of scale that GoDaddy has would have just like blown us out of the water if we tried to take that on at that point. And we didn't have, so we did it a little backwards as far as the whole like freemium, premium thing. We, we started with our premium product um, and eventually, released something for free on the WordPress repo and kind of saw that as a distribution channel. Um, and I think that for us, um, like it's, it's hard to give advice on, you know, how anyone could recreate this because it's, I do, I think we got kind of lucky and it was something we kind of accidentally fell into, but what we did and what worked was we had that free version. We kind of had the sampler available and, when we were originally talking to GoDaddy, we were, you know, trying to figure out like what would it, what would like a bulk license deal look like if we were going to try and sell, you know, our product to GoDaddy so they could distribute it to all their customers, and that was a really like daunting and scary idea because you know they they would probably have wanted like pennies on the dollar for what we were trying to sell it to ourselves, and you know you're talking about like getting into negotiations with M and A guys who've been. Um, negotiating their entire lives. Like we were just these little, like, we're like, Oh, I don't know. We're scared. We don't want to do this. But what ended up working for us and what ended up 
making that partnership happen was that we had the free version. Um, and then a like, year or so later, they kind of came back around once they'd ironed out a little bit more of what they were, what they were doing and had some more concrete plans and they were able to use our free version. And so that's, what's being bundled in with their WordPress hosting. Um, we gave them, we have like a special like modified version of that free version that gives them a couple of our premium features. So uh, GoDaddy customers do get like a, like an enhanced version of the free version. Um, but we still get to have, you know, a little button in there that says, Hey, if you want, if you want more, click here and, uh, and upgrade. So it's, it was really a win-win um, in that sense. And it's like, you know, you go to Costco and they have the free samples out there. It would be like if, uh, I don't know, like if you're, yeah, well, yeah, that, that's a great analogy right there. Like if you're just a little, you know, baking company and you're, you know, making cookies out of your house and, you know, Costco wants to work with you, you can give them a couple free samples to throw out there. And if people eat them and like them, you know, you're golden. So the, for us, the having the free version was what made that partnership happen possible along with the, the relationship building. That's awesome. Yeah. And part of that, one of the big things I'm hearing in there was just the courage to like, Oh my gosh, big company or, you know, all these M and a guys, it's just a lot of it just comes down to courage. So just to share a story from my side, uh, one of my first online course projects was in organic gardening and permaculture. And we went to the best selling author in the world in permaculture. And he was going to be speaking uh, at an event a couple States away from where I lived at the time. And we said, hey, can we film you and turn it into an online course? We'll do this kind of royalty share forever, work out a deal, sign right here, just say yes. And he said, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how it all started. But, nice. you know, we had to like, and now, and then he would promote his course or our course from his platform. And now we had, that was more distribution all through like relationships with a little bit of courage to like even go out there with the, the big players or whatever. So. Um, that's I, a, I could, yeah, I could totally relate to that reaching out. And that was something we still do and, and did a lot in the beginning, but it was reaching out to people for help. Um, and particularly I think in the WordPress community, we're really, we're really lucky that a lot of people are really generous, um, generous with their time. Uh, like if you, I'm not, if you and your viewers may or may not be interested, I'm sure you, but with uh, easy digital downloads and, and Pippin, right? Pippin mm -hmm. Williamson, he's a really big name and has a really successful and, and great product in the WordPress space. And, you know, he, we kind of, he was one of those guys we used to put up on a pedestal and, and we'd kind of emulate what he was doing with his business and ours. And uh, he wrote an article that we, we used and I ended up reaching out to him and writing him an email about something asking him a question and I was really nervous to do that at the time and we got this really thorough response back and he was really genuine and, and generous with with his time and knowledge but yeah reaching out for help you'll be surprised at how many people that you know that might be intimidating to you but will um, take the time to to help if you if you just ask that's awesome well also on the relationship front uh, you know relationship for marketing and sales and just being a good player in your industry is cool but you guys have also done such a great job of fostering and developing relationships inside your own community of, of users and customers. Um, I've seen you have a very active Facebook group, and I think there's multiple Facebook groups, and you have a, uh, an active Slack channel for a certain segment of power users. But what's your approach to community building internally, like around your business? Like, how did that get going, and how did that get going so well? Thanks. Thanks for all the kind words. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You're fluffing us up here. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah, our Facebook, uh, Facebook group and then the Slack channel are kind of the two hubs I'd say. And I wish I could take a lot more credit for them, but they actually were started both of them by uh, members of our community, by our users and, and customers. Um, and we were a little bit surprised to see them uh, flourish the way they have. And when that started, like, again, the snowball thing, but like when that snowball started rolling, we were like, wow, this is cool. And then we, we jumped onto it. Like we saw that, that, well, one of the nice things, right, is like a lot of people jump into those communities with questions. Uh, Beaver Builder is a page builder. A lot of people using it are building websites. And a lot of the questions they have aren't necessarily technical questions as far as like, you know, it's not the type of thing you'd put in a support ticket for, like, you know, a bug 
fix or a conflict or something, but it's like a general, like, Hey, this, there's this website that's doing this really cool technique, you know, like when you scroll down, all the things are fading in, or it's got this really cool design that I've never seen before. And like, how can I do that? How can I recreate that? Um, and, and yeah, that, that, that kind of, uh, the community lends itself really well to those kind of hive mind questions where you can tap into people's experiences. And, uh, we, we also, we also, I think, um, a lot of our user base is uh, freelancers and agencies and people that are not just kind of building websites for themselves and for their business, but are actually building websites as a business. And so that's also helped our, our community a lot in that, um, again, because yeah, when we first got started, and this is one of the things we've kind of learned and got better at over time is like identifying who our customers are. And at, at first, we kind of thought it was going to be do it yourselfers, like people that were, um, you know, like, like Joe's uh, candy shop needs a website or, you know, the real estate agent and someone recommended WordPress and, you know, they don't know code. So they found a, a way to do it by hand page building. And, um, but then, it, yeah, as we, as we've grown and kind of gotten more in tune with everyone, it's, it's turned out that where we started too, when we were building Beaver Builder was we needed a tool for our agency so that we could build websites faster. Um, and that resonated, I think, with a lot of other freelancers and agencies. So it, it's been it's been really organic. Um, but as far as like circling back to the the question about our our community and how we manage it and how we grow it, it's been very organic. But once it started, like once that kind of kindling caught on fire, uh, we just started throwing wood on top of it. Like we added a link to our community and our. Um, onboarding emails. If you purchase Beaver Builder, it says, "Hey, jump in our community." It's actually in the product now, and you're, you know, and you install it. It says, "Hey, we've got this great community. Come by, and like, we'd love to see you. Share our share projects. Say hello." And um, again, feeling very fortunate, but it, it's a. I think the whole WordPress community is is a very kind of like opening and generous. Like our our community is a microcosm of the WordPress community, which also kind of shares a lot of those those nice traits of of people being really generous with their knowledge and their time and. You, 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 I'm sure you've been part of communities online that, that just go to, you know, like, or th that are not very friendly places to spend time at, right? It seems like almost most communities that start, like, you know, think of like YouTube or Reddit or Dig. Right. If you, like, one on any of those sites, if you were there in the beginning, they were these kind of cool and fledgling places to spend time, and they eventually kind of progress and get worse and worse and worse. So <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen for us. Like, like knock on wood, but... But yeah, I think the WordPress community as a whole is is not heading in that direction. So that, that helps us a lot too. That's awesome. So the community starting point, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to come from, you know, the platform owner. That's really cool. And to see it evolve that way. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, with hindsight, if we, you know, if we could do everything over again, we would have set the Facebook group up on day one. Right. Uh, but again, this is going back to our like, you know, when we started Beaver Builder and the marketing side, like, we didn't really know what we were doing as far as marketing and building community. So we, yeah, it was, it worked out great that someone was like, Hey, you guys might want to do this. And if you want, I'll do it for you. Like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with any platform with when you have a strong user community, certain power users emerge. Like we have people who were just doing support for free in our Facebook group or, other people like building their own products that go on top of Lifter LMS. Um, so when we when you see a power user, uh, my approach is just to do whatever that you can to help them be successful. And if that includes, if it's possible, giving them a job or a part-time job or helping promote what they're up to through other channels, um, try to reward those power users. But what's been your experience with power users? Where do they come from? And then what do you do with them? Hmm, that's a good, I'm trying to think of a like concise answer here. Um, I, so <laughs> trying to think of one, but I don't have one. So let me like ramble about a long story again. <laughs> now, just really quickly, I have my, like one of my first, the first websites I ever built um, was a forum and I was a part of a, a forum. This was kind of in like the web 2.0 days, maybe like around like 2003 to five, six, somewhere in that like window. Um, I was part of a forum for like a video game that I really liked and there was this community on this forum and you know, the, like the guy that ran it, um, I just, I saw that and I was like, Oh, I want to learn how to do that. Like, I think that would be a really cool thing to, you know, 
to have and do. So I started a forum about surfing. I started a couple of them, but one of the ones I started was on surfing. And, uh, but yeah, that's so that idea. Like that, that, I think it's a natural thing when you're developing a community. Like the hardest thing at first is getting people in there, right? Like if you're ever doing a forum, or I'm sure courses and, and classes are very similar too. Like because of course, right? In the education space, having a community really helps because um, everyone can learn and and encourage each other to keep going. Um, you really, you really do have to fight for your first like 100 users or whatever. I mean, yeah, you be creative. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like w with the forum thing, and I know I remember reading a story. I mentioned Reddit, but you know those guys all had like 20 fake accounts. We did this. <laughs> I did this too on my forum, and you go in there and just have conversations with yourself. You know, and you like these conversations, and um, but I th yeah, I think with the, in the forum space, you write, you like, you have moderators and you can give people some control over, you know, the ability to like help you monitor spam and keep things in line. And, and I think it's a natural, I mean, when I was doing forums and now in the Beaver Builder community, like we weren't out there like recruiting power users, people just kind of naturally take on those roles. Um, but if you can identify those people and then like you were saying, assist them and give them tools, whether that be, you know, the ability to help you moderate the community or even just like reaching out and giving them encouragement and saying thanks and identifying like, Hey, you've been putting a lot of time in here. I love what you're doing. We really appreciate it. Um, identifying those power users and just kind of nurturing them and, and saying, is there, any, Hey, if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. Cause I, you know, we, what you're doing here is great. And it's been helpful for us. So that, uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's the best way to do is just like, yeah, trying to identify those people and, and, um, and, and nurture them as opposed to trying to generate them or find them and bring them in. Like it's something that kind of happens naturally. Yeah. And one thing I'd add to that is sometimes my first reaction, depending upon what they're doing, it may not be positive. Like, wait, what is this person doing with the brand or what is this new product that I, they didn't consult with me about or whatever. But then I, I say, hold on, and I take a step back. I'm like, this is beautiful. Somebody's like, they're so excited about the product that they're going off in this direction with it. That's great. So I don't know. That's just been my experience. Most of the time I'm positive and super happy about it. But at first, when these people start popping out up out of quote nowhere. It's like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, no, I can relate to that. Even I was telling the story of like our our group, our Facebook group and the Slack channel were happening organically. Like it was something we didn't have control over. And there was a part of us that were like, Oh, I don't know if we want this to like, I don't, I don't know if we want to have someone else in control of this, you know, group that's using our name or that's kind of leveraging our, our community. Um, and, but yeah, it's a balancing act, you know, and, and, uh, and in most cases, those have been, uh, it's been, a, it's been a good thing. I mean, like occasionally get people in there that are like, you know, like spamming, right. They're like, Oh, check this, you know, buy this, this thing. I, you know, but yeah, you'll see those posts. They're like, Oh man, Hey, I just got this service and I started using it. And it's been amazing. Like if, if I like it this much, you guys will probably like it this much. And, and, uh, you know, maybe depending on what kind of community you're in, they, like some of like nine out of 10 of those might be spam, but one of those might be genuine or vice versa. Maybe it's like nine of them are genuine and one of them is a, is a spam post, but, but yeah, it is a little bit, uh, you do kind of have to like, again, finding that balance point. Um, but then encouraging the, the good and, and trying to politely and politically filter out the bad. Yeah. And if you have a, <clears throat> like a learning platform and then a community that goes with it, whether that's a Facebook group or some kind of, Slack channel or buddy press thing or whatever it is. One of the most beautiful things that can emerge is when the community starts moderating. I would never recommend just relinquishing leadership or control over moderation. Like you should always be involved in keeping quality high, but it's, it's always a really cool thing to see when the community starts protecting itself or helping identify or helping guide people like, Oh, that's not really appropriate here. Whatever it is. That's uh that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think no one likes to be told what to do for the most part. And, and yeah, if you go in there with the kind of like dictator attitude, like this shall not stand and this, you know, like if you go in there with that, that kind of all powerful uh, attitude, I think people respond a lot better when you say, Hey, like this, this came up, what do you guys think? How should we handle this? Like as you know, the leadership, what do you guys want? And, 
I mean, just applying that rule, like even to our, you know, our product, right? Like a lot of our features and, and things we implement come from our community and, and reaching out to, you know, you know in, in building a community, right? You're, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for the people that are, uh, that are a part of it and involving them as much as you can in every way you can, I think is, is really beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and negative things happen. I actually, like the first time I saw a Lyft LMS premium product on some kind of torrent download site, <laughs> I was like, I was celebrated because I'm like, awesome. We're so, <laughs> we're, we're, we're big enough. We're desirable enough that somebody wants to pirate the software. That's great. We made it. Yeah. Right. I actually, I actually heard somebody <laughs> else say that in a podcast. So I kind of had preconditioned myself for that moment to happen. But when it did happen, I was like, all right, check. There's, a, there's a <laughs> there. <laughs> that's awesome yeah you're an optimist i can tell right because I've, I've had a similar uh the similar thought but then i've also seen it go like the opposite direction like people getting really upset about that or you know occasionally we'll, it, it's really nice right but we'll get like our user that will email us and be like hey have you guys seen there there's this like nulled version of beaver builder out there like these guys are being jerks like you got to go get them and shut them down and it's like ah uh, well it could be a lot worse you know like we could be not you know no one might not be interested in us or <laughs> Yeah, I think I'd much rather have people be interested enough to to pirate our software than otherwise. This is a timeless issue. I mean, for course creators, harken back to book publishing. I remember, I think, uh, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. I saw this audiobook version narrated by him, freely available on YouTube. <laughs> and Paulo Coelho left a really nice comment below the video. But. Uh, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, piracy is just part of the digital world. And some people call that the Newsweek model. Like if you go to a doctor's office, you can pick up a magazine. You didn't pay for it. You can get the content or whatever. So maybe it's not the end of the world if your stuff ends up kind of in some interesting places. There, It is definitely, you know, your intellectual property. And in some cases, you have to fight to protect it and regain control of it. But think about it. I mean, if it's worth, you got to pick and choose your battles, I guess is what I'm saying. Totally, totally. In in that light, one of the things um, I've noticed with you and Beaver Builder is, and you've built a brand, a strong brand, um, both the the kind of the brand of Beaver Builder and and then just I think a strong personal brand in the the community and in the industry. But one of the things I notice is if somebody writes a post about Beaver Builder or about an event you're at or whatever, like you're you're like there in the comments or in the Facebook group or whatever, like how do you keep up, you know, as you grow and get bigger and you lose control of your every piece of content and other people start doing stuff on their own, like how do you keep track with your, of your brand around the web? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's gotten a lot more difficult as we've grown. So I've, I know I'm falling off on it a lot these days. I need to get back on that horse, but, uh, one of the things I used to do religiously, um, and this was actually a trick. Like I used to, I'm a pretty big gamer. I always have been. And I don't know if any of you or like your listeners are did World of Warcraft, but uh, I definitely put in some hours on on World of Warcraft, right? And one of the things in World of Warcraft is you have daily quests, and it's right. something that you just do every day. Like each day, you can do this quest and get some gold or get a prize or whatever, but you can only do it once per day. Um, and so I really got into that like routine when I was a gamer of starting doing my dailies. Right. Yeah. And I, I tried to, to translate that over to the business. And so I have these kind of like daily chores and again, I've, I've fallen off. I'm not, I'm not as good. I'm not, I'm not very good at keeping routines, but for a while there I was really religious and I had a, a folder of bookmarks um, on my, in my, on my browser that I called dailies and I just opened them every morning. And one of them <clears throat> was, uh, like I use uh, tweet deck, but one of them was tweet deck. And I have a search for our name, like beaver builder with a space beaver builder with no space. It's just this one big combined search that will put up every single mention of beaver builder on Twitter. And then I also have a Google search, uh, for Beaver Builder. And then with Google, it's, it's really cool because you can, um, if you go into their tools menu, there's an option to search for uh, mentions or like whatever the term is, but for, for things that were published within a certain time frame, like in the last 24 hours or the last week or the last year. 
And so one of my dailies was just like popping open that browser tab with the search for Beaver Builder over the last 24 hours. So anytime something was published on Beaver Builder, I had it right there and I'd jump in and, and make a point to just say, hey, thanks, you know, thanks for, for the mention. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to think what else was on there. I had a couple of like the, the news sites. I'd, I'd try and keep track of the kind of WordPress news I think if there's anything else like applicable on there that I had in my little, my dailies, I don't want to look it up right now, but, but yeah, that, that was my trick was, was doing the, the Google search and the tweet deck search and then just making a part like my, with my morning coffee, popping it open, seeing what was out there and just, and responding to it. That's, that's awesome. I do that as well where, um, every day I ha I don't call it my dailies or whatever, but I have this thing where I go check certain places and see what's going on. But I'm definitely taking notes on using the um, Google tools and the, the tweet deck to kind of find things a little easier. That's, yeah, that's, I love that. I love that ability to search Google in a certain time frame, um, And I use it all the time, you know, outside of business related stuff too. If it, like using Google as a skill. I mean, we were talking a little bit off air, like before we started recording about, uh, education and you know I, I mentioned that I'm like I, I was a horrible student but I loved learning and being skillful with Google I think is just one of the most powerful ways to learn uh, and, and Google's such a powerful tool too if you dig into like um, the, the ways you can you know connect searches with um, like you can search for certain terms like an exact match or you can do look at the comma so you're looking for this or that or the plus sign, so it's this and that, and you can like negate uh, certain terms and, and being able to kind of manipulate Google and manipulate the results that it returns is, is, is so, so powerful. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of just the education I've gotten online on my own terms has been from like, you know, like learning, how, it's like, you know, like, it's like, like a good analogy might be your code editor, right? Like if you're a coder, they say you should really take some time to get to know your editor. Um, and kind of learn the shortcuts and learn the inner workings. And I feel a lot, a lot that way about Google too. As an aside, sorry, I know this is getting a little off track here. <laughs> no, that's really good. If, if I could teach a skill, like there's, everybody thinks they understand Google or, you know, just like everybody's above average driver or whatever. But when we actually <laughs> hire a developer, one of the things we're looking for when we ask them like, what do you do and you get stuck? Well, we want to hear, we basically want to find people who are problem solvers, not necessarily super credentialed. In order to be a big problem solver, you have to know how to use Google really well. And most people think that there's like truly an art to it, like these kind of things you're talking about with the date range search or how to search forums, how to tell quality results. Totally. Other and all those things. It's, a, it's, I mean, Google, I, like I would just say, I, I don't know, like <clears throat> maybe 90% of people are like way under optimizing what's possible with it. <laughs> okay, you just gave me an idea and I, yeah. part of me doesn't want to say it because this is going to be my like golden goose kind of thing, but I'll put it out there for your audience because I probably won't have the time to do it. But I've been like, ever since I met you and, and learned about Lifter, I've been wanting to do a course. Uh, yeah. And okay, I'm going to do, I, I, if you guys get to it first, go for it. But someday I'm going to do a course on like power Google use. I think that'd be a cool one. That is a cool course. I just want to say that I've seen this over and over again. The uh, companies that make something like Google or Beaver Builder or Lyft or whatever, the best courses are actually always made by another company. So it, like it wouldn't, like there's this guy, uh, I forget, is Michael something? He wrote, he made, has a course about the Scrivener software. The guy who has the best course about Evernote does not work at Evernote. <laughs> um, I know people make courses about Beaver Builder that aren't at Beaver Builder. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to do both, but what I'm saying is even Google, Google has all the resources in the world, but why doesn't that course exist? Why haven't we found it? Maybe the world needs Robbie or some, some <laughs> one of the listeners out there to curate that wisdom down into a course. That's a good point. I, I think, I used to think this about Photoshop and then we kind of fell into a similar space, but the guys who like at Adobe who created Photoshop, I wonder if they look over, you know, some of the artwork and some of just the like amazing talented people that have been able to use their tool to produce, you know, whatever it is that, you know, the, the guys that are building Photoshop probably aren't 
those, you know, 1% of the 1% kind of talented and skilled artists that are creating the, the beautiful, like, portraits or whatnot. And that must be like, you know, if you're, if you're creating canvases, it must be so cool to see the artwork that people put onto it. And uh, we've, we have a little taste of that at Beaver Builder and that we created this tool that allows people to create web pages. And I get that feeling a lot when I'm looking at like we have our showcase or when people tweet us and say, hey, like check out this site I made. And it's just like so above and beyond anything that I would be able to do. Like when you see that kind of culmination of talent and experience coming together um, in a medium that you helped put out there. Ah, it's such a cool, like such a cool feeling. And, and yeah, and you're right. There's, there's folks like we're doing a pretty good, we're doing an okay job at like creating Beaver Builder, but there's folks out there that are so much better than us now at, at using it, which is bittersweet, right? Like I, <laughs> I wish I had more time to, to explore and, and write code and, and do design, but yeah, anyways. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating facet. Well, let's talk a little bit about democratization, which is in some ways in the WordPress community, people joke about it sometimes that everybody's trying to democratize something, but um, in some ways, you know, WordPress uh, is known to, to democratize publishing. Like it's not just the big media brands that can create content or news or websites, you know, even so a lot of people go to something like Twitter to get news before they go to the New York times or whatever. Um, at Lifter, we like to say that we're democratizing education, both for the teacher and for the learner. And for you guys, it's almost like you're democratizing the ability to build websites where, you know, whether you're a, a small business owner or business owner or a builder of products for that market, you're bringing, you're, you're bringing the accessibility and, uh, to someone who, which, you know, puts downward pressure on the price and the skills required to launch or to create this thing. Um, but let's talk about democratization a little bit. First with Beaver Builder, um, it's really fascinating how, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's always a layer in technology where, uh, you know, when websites, you know, it used to be super expensive and you had to have a webmaster write every line of HTML. Then CMSs came like WordPress and now you're a page builder on top of WordPress. And um, <clears throat> it's just another layer of abstraction around above the ones and zeros that make up yeah, electronic yeah. communication. But where is, I guess, where is the democratization heading for you guys, for Beaver Builder? Like what's next? What, what is the next evolution of the of of what you're doing bringing that accessibility and the ability to for people to build great looking sites without being a developer or designer like where where is it going from here that's a, gosh that's a good question or a tough and good question um well one like the thought that instantly came to my mind is um to go back to the the partnership we're doing with godaddy um I don't know if, if uh, you get this in your community. I get this all the time. Uh, like one of my mom's friends was, uh, is an artist and, and my mom, she told me that she, like she was out for coffee and, and she mentioned that, you know, her son uh, Robbie was doing something with, with GoDaddy and, and uh, her friend was like, oh, GoDaddy. Like, oh no, they're horrible. They're, like, they're a terrible. Kind of, like, what are they? Oh, no, no. There's like this like, really horrible stigma, right? But on this topic of democrat democratization, um, GoDaddy is is one of the most affordable web hosts out there, and if if you're trying to get a website or a business online, um, they're one of the best. I mean, you, you really like the bang for your buck. There is so 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 high. You get so much value out of that, and I'm really I mean we're thrilled to be a part of that because you know their whole push in when they included our product. Um, they, it's part of this onboarding tool, which basically it, it, when you sign up for a WordPress website for GoDaddy, they walk you through this process of like, hey, okay, like your site needs a name. Um, they're targeting this towards people who aren't necessarily developers or designers. I mean, they're trying to get small businesses and people, you know, course creators are a great example of like someone that might be out there that has a talent or a skill or builds something and they want to share that and maybe build a revenue stream around that. Um, and so I think that partnership with GoDaddy that we have right now is really powerful on that, on that note that, that 
their effort to make it easier for small businesses and, and, you know, entrepreneurs, creative people to get online and get their skill, talent, course, product, whatever in front of people. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to, how do I end this off there? I think that's been like a really cool thing for us in that, like, you know, in that uh, vein. <clears throat> as far as, yeah, and like what we have, what we have planned, um, like I'm hoping we can do that with every major web, like, hey, if you're a major web host and you're listening, uh, <laughs> come find us. We want to make it easier for your uh, <laughs> customers to, to build websites. But um, it's, it's a really, I think we live in a really cool time right now. And it, you know, it's never been easier. I mean, like the music industry is a good one, right? Like 25, 30, 40 years ago. Um, if you wanted to get music in front of someone, like you needed to have a, you know, tens of hundreds of thousand dollar recording studio and you needed to have a, you know, CD press or a printing press. I mean, they, you know, you could record something onto a tape deck at one point, but, you know, technology has made it like exponentially easier for people to create and to share their artwork. And it's such an amazing time in that, you know, like there's top club hits that are being made by, you know, some kid on a laptop now and that technology that, you know, like they say the, the computer that sent a man to the moon, you know, like my iPhone seven is, is 20 times more powerful than that now. Like the, it's just wild how much uh, opportunity we have to, to um, yeah, put, put stuff out there and, and build and create and share. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of at the root of democratization is that things just get easier. Like you're mentioning with GoDaddy, they're kind of getting in front of the problem of, okay, I've got a non-technical customer. How do I get them set up what, and like just remove layers of complexity or decision fatigue and just give them the best tools for what they're trying to do mm -hmm. so that by the time they're done with the setup process, they're like ready to roll uh, without having to like, okay, I have hosting, now what? Um, it's, it's just a fascinating thing. And that's, I think that's what democratization is all about. If you're, um, you know, if you're wanting to teach, that's like one of our goals is to make it so that technology is, is more accessible in terms of piecing together the components that make up an online course. Um, yeah, I, I I mean, hearing you say that too, I wish, and why, why I love what you guys are doing at Lifter and I love the whole you know, the, just the idea of, of online education. Um, it's like, I, man, I wish I'd learned some of those skills in school, you know, like I wish when I was in high school, there was a class on, you know, building a business or, you know, I was always really passionate and creative, but, but it was like, it was like looked at as like a bad thing, you know, like I was ditching class to go play guitar because I wanted to be a rock star and everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, this is a horrible choice. You know, you need to like conform, you need to go to school and then you need to go to college and then you'll get the, the job and the pension. And, and, you know, even just since I'm, I'm in my thirties now, like things have changed a lot since then, but that, that kind of process that, you know, maybe the generation before us was able to leverage a lot better isn't, necessarily gonna be an option for a lot of people you know here in the states um this might be like exclusive dust here um that used to you know the whole american dream that used to be it you know like you follow the you follow the the, the line to the end you get the job you get the pension and that's that's how it all worked but now i think that in the future more people are going to be needing to start their own businesses and kind of make their own their own way in the world and and uh yeah, it's, I think it, it might even, I, don't, I can go as far as to say that might be a better quality of life, you know, like being your own boss and getting to, to do your own thing and explore your, your passions and your creativity. I mean, being able to produce that club hit on your laptop, that guy was having a lot more fun than if he was flipping burgers at McDonald's, I imagine. Absolutely. And if you want to see a great uh, example of what Robbie is talking about in terms of uh, producing that club hit there's a uh, a website that delivers online courses from some of the best in the world um and it's called masterclass.com it's not powered by lifter lms but uh what's his name dead mouse do you know who oh yeah oh yeah sure <laughs> he's, he's probably one of the best in the world at electronic music yeah go check out just the intro video to his online course and, you know, he, that was his point is you, he's saying that like what people are making on a laptop, you don't need all this fancy recording studio. The democratization of creating this art form has never been more accessible. So 
if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to create electronic music, I now have access to one of the best in the world at it and he can teach me how to do it from home and so on. It's not to say that there's no time and place for traditional education systems or in-person training, but there's never been a better time to both teach or learn in these really tight, interesting niches, which I would agree with you. I had a similar experience where the mainstream just wasn't quite doing it for me or I wasn't, I just wasn't getting the pieces or the, at least the spin or the flavor on it that was of interest to me or whatever it was, was kind of outdated or not relevant or whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was also young and dumb back then too. Now I look back on those days, like I've been watching this documentary, uh, the untold history of the United States. It's on Netflix. It's by Oliver Stone. And, um, I even, I moved out to an area. I, I live close to a reservoir that, um, used to be there used to be a couple of logging towns and they flooded them so they're ghost towns and we've had a drought here in California and the reservoir has gotten historically low and a bunch of the kind of remnants from these towns started um, appearing and I, I you know I never liked history when I was in high school but but being like immersed in it and and watching this documentary like history is fascinating I'm like man I wish I had uh, I didn't have the appreciation for it back then but but no I I, I agree I'm like you know, talking down on traditional education. And that's, that's, that, that was just my experience, but no, I wish I could do it all over again with the, the kind of wisdom and maturity I have now, because it, it is, there's a lot of fascinating stuff out there that, yeah, you just got to kind of find, find how you relate to it. And that's awesome. It makes it a lot more interesting and a lot easier, I think, to learn when you're interested and um, passionate about something or when you have a, a when you find it on your, maybe from that's, maybe that's what it was for me. It was finding things on my own. I had a hard time kind of following. What, well, I could talk about <laughs> it's all about that, all about my uh, yeah struggles with education as a youth. But maybe we should. Uh, <laughs> no, that's 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 part of the we share that story, and I think that concept of finding stuff on your own, like now with this proliferation of online education and all these niche. Um, trainings that are available online or in person or at these events on the most obscure topics, like you can now find that stuff. (laughs) Whereas, or like some webinar about something really specific that you would been into, but that just wasn't around when you were 16 or 20 or 25 or whatever. So that's the beauty of this day and age. Um, there's just never been more opportunity. The technology is here for people to create that kind of stuff and also to find it. And, uh, you know, you can become a self-styled person. I often think about the professional world. If, uh, like, like let's say a company like Apple wants to hire a programmer or whatever, they could put together like, okay, you're going to need to learn this online course, this online course, like to, to get the jobs of the future it's almost going to be up to the employers of the company to create like the perfect package of experiences where they're not necessarily looking at degree programs from the best universities, but they want to see somebody who uh, has done all these like different things that aren't necessarily part of the traditional education system, especially since the world, especially in technology is changing so fast. Um, That's God. That's a great point. Yeah. You know, because like, all the like, com- like computer science, right? Like intro to computer science at every university. Um, over the years, the language has changed, right? It's been you know C or maybe it's Python or it's gone. You know, like a lot of people have been encouraging JavaScript as a first language these days, and you know to to learn this like just in the subject of engineering and programming to learn the basics. It doesn't really matter which language you pick, but uh, yeah, if you're Apple and you have the iPhone, which is what is it like? Um, they're not swift or, is it swift or you know like yeah. whatever they have their their stack and they have the, the like why wouldn't you want someone that learned on that stack and those you know well i guess there's benefits to to learning other languages too but no i i think that's a really interesting point that that yeah if you can groom your own um you'd be a lot more efficient to kind of groom your own uh people with your tools and your environment and as things have gotten infinitely you know, more complex and the you know, others instead of just being the one you know a couple like five classical programming languages now there's thousands and frameworks and the, those abstraction layers we talked about you know that's they're only going to keep getting more and more uh, prolific and, and complicated so absolutely yeah when i hire a developer 
I, I almost don't even care about their academic background. It's more like, what can you do? Or let me see some examples or what, what struggles, like, how did you talk? Let's talk about how you work through problems. Yeah. And yeah. like, and then what kind of person are you? Uh, like where you went to school is like, Oh, I guess I don't even ask that. <laughs> so, and then they're not going to apply or show interest if they're, you know, at least they don't have a shot. So yeah, it's a, it's a different world out there. Well, uh, Robbie McCullough, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show. If people want to find out more about you or Beaver Builder, where, where should people go check you out besides joining the Facebook group and the Slack channel? Yeah, thanks. Um, so our website is wpbeaverbuilder.com. Um, I, uh, we do, uh, we're pretty active on Twitter under the Beaver Builder um, hash or the Beaver Builder account. And then I have a personal account at Robbie McCullough, which I don't tweet a lot, but it's a great way to, if you want to like reach out and ping me about something, I'm, I'm there and listening. And uh, yeah, yeah, this has been a really great chat. Thanks so much for having me. I, we got into some cool, some cool, we got to dig into some cool topics. This was a really fun one. Awesome. Well, thank you, Robbie, and have an awesome day. My pleasure. See ya.